So let's briefly consider the most common other strategy that economists consider. So, so Fed, what would happen if the firms in that model were to have taken the other firms' prices as given rather than their quantity? So go on, yeah. Well then, so if you take our base price scale, you can undercut them by just a little bit, just right? Little bit. So what would be an equilibrium? Imagine there's two firms that have a co cost C. What would be an equilibrium between them? Um, well, I don't know in terms of C, but the one who has the lower by just a little bit uh, price. Well, that's right, but then wouldn't the other person go just a little bit below him to get all of it? That's true. So and the other person would go a little bit? Yeah, so they'd get to see. Yeah, so <coughs> the only equilibrium is that the price is exactly the cost. Yeah, Edward. Is there really price discrimination happening like, in this whole process? Like, no, I was, I was, like, we're assuming that people have a uniform price during this process. Okay. Um, competition with price discrimination is an extremely interesting topic, uh, and if you're interested in it, you should look at the... Um, I've been working on that. So the, the product design lecture, the paper, the Vega Wild paper is all about that. So, um, yeah, David. Why would both firms operate at C and make no profits when they could just operate at the same price and make like half of whatever profits? Because if they undercut the guy by a tiny, tiny bit, they get 100% of the profit. Yeah, but they know that the other guy's going to do that same thing and drive it. Well, that's a good. That's a good point. So you're thinking if they can look like that. Well, so but you're 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 pointing out exactly what the problem with game theory is, right? Which is that it assumes that everyone takes as given whatever the other firm's strategy is, and that seems a bit silly, right? As a way to think about things. So that that's exactly what the lecture is going to be all about. But but you know we're just we're sticking with the model right now, and then we're going to critique the model in a moment. Um, but yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, if the firm is sort of looking ahead to what other firms are going to do, you know, it might not just uh, undercut. Um, okay, so um, positive markups can never be in equilibrium. Everyone undercuts as long as there's more than one firm price is equal to cost. This is called the Bertrand Edgeworth paradox or critique of the Cournot model. It's thought to be a paradox because it seems really weird that a firm with an industry with just two firms would be perfectly competitive like this, right? Um, and I think this is uh, absurd, uh, as I hope you do. Um, and we're going to talk about some potential resolutions for this. So one is that firms differ in their costs, and they may not know the costs of other firms. Another one is that the products produced by the firms may not be exactly the same either because they're sort of inherently different or because consumers have trouble finding the other products. So like you're browsing on eBay, it may be offered for a lower price somewhere else, but it would be a pain in the butt to go look for it. Anyone who came to John Levin's talk heard a lot of conversation about those types of issues. Um, or because of what David was talking about, firms may not take as given the prices of other firms. right? And basically the rest of the lecture is going to be about how we resolve this paradox by thinking about these types of issues. Right? These are three pretty plausible reasons why this sort of silly conclusion is wrong. And we're going to think about how we can use all of those to understand what really goes on in the whole topic. Okay, so the simplest of the responses is that firms just differ in their costs. So in this case, things are basically like a first price auction, right? Each firm tries to just beat the next firm. It doesn't want to beat it by very much because it doesn't want the price to be too low, right? So in that case, prices are not equal to the minimum, to the lowest um, cost of any firm in the industry. Instead, they're equal to the expectation that that firm has of the cost of the next best firm, because it tries to just be below the next best. Is that looking ahead, or is that not? Not looking ahead. No, taking even if they just take as given what everyone else is doing, <coughs> even if they're uncertain about other people's things, they're going to just try to beat the next guy. But if you know people have different costs, and I don't know what someone else's cost is, I'm not just going to bid you know exactly my cost, right? I'm going to bid just below what the second lowest person's cost is, right? Um, and so, as we get more firms, the second lowest firm 
is going to get closer to the first lowest firm. Imagine that firms are just drawn from some distribution. As there get to be lots of firms, right, the second highest thing is going to get close to the first highest thing if there's you know, some lower bound on cost. Uh, if there wasn't some lower bound on cost, that wouldn't necessarily be true. But for a lower bound on cost, that would be true. So the first and second are going to get closer and closer to one another. And so that means that as a gradual process, sort of like in the Cournot model, the price should go down towards the cost of the lowest cost firm. Right? But it's going to be a much more gradual process uh, than in the extreme case. And so that brings it closer to the sorts of ideas of the Cournot model. So one major virtue of the Cournot model is that it's super simple. <laughs> and yet, um, even in the simple version, it behaves a bit like this more complicated version of the Bertrand law. So that's one reason to favor it. Um, is that because it leads to sort of sensible conclusions, it lets us sort of imitate this more complicated model in a simple case. Um, and this is a broader thing, which is anytime you reach sort of an absurd conclusion from a model, your reaction should not necessarily be, uh, oh, we've been thinking about things wrong, but rather, what's wrong with the assumptions that I made? Right? Okay. So another more popular response than the one I just described is to consider models with differentiated products. So that is, um, you know, in the Bertrand Edgeworth model, right, if we're selling the exact same product and I undercut you by a tiny bit, I steal all the demand from you. But if you go to any company in the world and you ask them, if you lower your price by a little bit, will you get in discontinuously more sales? they would say, you know, almost certainly not, right? Because there's lots of things that cause people to not be able to find the products or to view the products differently or be loyal to one firm or whatever, right? And um, that, we summarize all those things as saying consumers view the products as being differentiated. And this can be because they differ in some non-price characteristics as we discussed last week. Or they can be identical, but consumers may have to look for the products, and so may not be completely aware of the change in price. Um, okay, so in either case, we can write um, the demand that firm I faces as a function of the prices of all the firms in the market, P1 through Pn. Right? So Qi is the demand for firm I's product. And as long as this is a nice, smooth function, there's not going to be any sort of Bertrand-style discontinuity. Right? So if someone else increases their price, that might raise my demand by quite a bit, but it's not going to like cause it to jump to infinity or something like that. Um, so uh, this, this sort of reflects a, a general principle in economics which is the epigraph of Marshall's Principles of Economics, which was one of the first really influential economics textbooks, which is natura non facet facet saltum. Nature doesn't make jumps. So like anytime you see some weird uh, extreme thing going on, it's probably because the model's missing something to make it smooth again. And that's what we just did. Okay. So each firm is a monopolist on its own product. Uh, but it, the other products are substitutes for the product. What does it mean for another product to be substitutes? Well, well if the other firm increases its price, that uh, is going to increase my quantity. Okay. Um, so... Um, this is a very broad model, and we could either think of firms as choosing their quantities and then the prices being set by some sort of market equilibrium, or think of the firms as choosing their prices and have the quantity set by market equilibrium. Uh, however, the sort of central approach that's most often used is what's called you know, Nash and Prices, or Bertrand which is an equilibrium of this where everyone takes the other price, firm's prices as a given. Um, and so this model is called differentiated products, Nash and prices. Okay. So the same basic principles are going to apply for pricing in this case 
that we use to think about monopoly. So we can de define the residual elasticity of a firm's demand. So that's the elasticity of demand holding fixed the prices of the other firms. So that's partial QI, partial PI, holding fixed all the other prices, times PI over QI. Um, and then <coughs> firms are going to price according to the learner rule. Price minus marginal cost over price is equal to 1 over the residual elasticity of demand. So this is what we sort of said in the monopoly lecture. Monopoly is not just, all the monopoly stuff is not just applicable when the firm is literally the only firm, but when any time the firm faces some residual demand. And notice that there's really nothing special about strategies as, as prices. We could just as easily think of the firm as choosing its quantity here. Right? The key point is that it's holding fixed, when it does that, the prices of all the other firms. Not, uh, not that it chooses its price for some <coughs> um, We could also do this Nash in quantities. But then what we'd have to do is not do this holding fixed every other firm's uh, price, but holding fixed every other firm's quantity. And that would require doing some complicated matrix inversion of these derivatives. Um, Okay, uh, but, but the ideas would be very similar. So there's no uh, reason that differentiated products requires prices to be the firm's strategies. It's just <coughs> that it turns out for various historical reasons that this is used very broadly in industrial economics. Okay, so um, um, So, um, oligopolis create externalities on one another. Uh, and is J Jason is not here. Um, uh, so, under Cournot, these externalities between the oligopolis are purely pecuniary. And Michael? Mike Wayne, could you explain why under Cournot the externalities are purely pecuniary? Well, so all the firms take as given the other firm's quantities, right? So what is the only way they could affect the other firms? Exactly. And we know that a change in any, any externality that's mediated through prices is a purely pecuniary externality, right? So from the perspective of every firm, if it changes its quantity, the only effect that has is on the prices of the other firms, not on how much they produce, right? Um, and uh, so it believes, yeah. On the other hand, under differentiated products, Nash and prices, um, Sharda, why is there a, a real externality? Don't look at the slide. Okay. <laughs> so under Nash and commodities, there's a real externality. Under Nash and prices. When, when I take as given the prices of the other firm, oh. why is there a real externality? Oh, because if you take the prices of the other firm, there's a change in quantity. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, there's no pecuniary externality. It's all real externality, right? Because I'm taking as given the prices of the other firms, right? So anything that the other firms lose is lost to society. It's not uh, just gained by the consumers, right? The consumers, in fact, you know, only gain directly from my reduction in my price. They don't gain anything from the change in my other firms' prices. Um, uh, and uh, under Cournot, the too low. Sorry. Quantities will always be too low under Cournot.